Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, this uh, portion of the lecture and, and demonstration is normally done by uh, one of my mentors, uh, Mario DePinto, uh, who was one of my professors at, uh, during fellowship at the University of Washington before he went over to the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he can't make it uh, this week uh, uh, due, so, due to a family member's illness. And uh, we wish him and his family uh, all the best. Uh, so Mario, we're thinking of you and I uh, hope to get you back next year. Okay, but uh, I'll be using uh, Dr. DePinto's slides uh, today in regards to uh, going over uh, cervical and lumbar medial branch neurotomies. Uh, if we could uh, start the slideshow and I'll try and go over the slides as best I can from the lab and then come to the lab and uh, we'll go over some of these uh, more important uh, Oh, okay. Oh, uh, sure. Um, let's maybe uh, can go over some of the uh, anatomy uh, and uh, uh, and have a kind of landmark here uh, while we're uh, waiting for the slides to be uh, brought up. How about that? Unless uh, the audience has a lot of questions uh, uh, regarding um, relievant and uh, the uh, fusion. We got, uh, we got it. Can you can you see the slides up there, Glenn? I cannot. We'll get you. No problem. No problem. So we've got our first slides. Um, well, you can't see it either. We'll get you here in just a second. So this is all him. <laughs> so this was the first, you know. Yeah, let's well, start right here. That's perfect. Yep. Thank you, Ramo. So if you kind of look at the uh, cervical and uh, lumbar. Uh, facet joints, uh, the paired planar true synovial joints located between the inferior articular processes of one vertebra and the superior articular processes of the next. next slide. If you look at the, oh, let's go back to the uh, one, yeah, the, ooh, there we go. Uh, lumbar and cervical facet joints and the referral pattern. This is something really kind of key in on. Uh, uh, this, these were very helpful uh, patterns when I was a fellow and learning, uh, well, what area, um, uh, of the uh, body uh, would refer from these uh, facet joints for the lumbar and cervical area. And these are good ones to kind of look up and uh, to note for C23, C34, 45. What area am I seeing that it can radiate to and refer to, uh, whether it be in the lumbar area, into the buttocks, into the back of the thighs, <laughs> lateral thigh, anterior thigh, into the groin? Something you kind of key, key in on as you're examining the patient and, and, and palpating the facet joints, loading the facet joint. Uh, and seeing, well, where is the pattern of pain and what particular joints are actually painful on palpation. Uh, so these are the things really keep on is the physical examination, but also the history. Uh, is it painful with, uh, with uh, a lot of twisting, moving uh, types of actions? And uh, the pain not be, may not be uh, there with just walking, like you'll see with uh, lumbar stenosis. Uh, innervation of facet joints. Of course, in coming off the uh, dorsal real ganglion, we get the medial branches, uh, and L1 to L4 target nerve is the medial branch of the dorsal ramus, and the nerves run across the neck of the superior articular process. As we know, uh, each facet joint receives innervation from medial branches arising from primary ramus at the same level of one level above the joint, and, and sorry, at the same level and one level above the joint. For example, L4-5 joint is innervated by the L4 medial branch and also the L3 medial branch. And as we know, in a lot of the uh, board examinations, we'll see like, these type of questions. Uh, if we look at on the L5 dorsal ramus itself, it's part of the innervation of the L5-S1 facet joint. Uh, the L5 primary dorsal ramus nerve lies between the, the ala, secret ala and the S1 superior articular process. AP radiograph of the contrast medium injected onto the target points of L3 and L4 medial branches, and for the L5 primary dorsal ramus. If you click one more time, I think it'll show up a little better. Maybe not. Yeah, I don't know why some of these images are not showing up. I, yeah. I'm just seeing what, I'm, what you're seeing. Okay. But uh, looking at the cervical medial branches at, C, at the uh, C2-3 facet joint level, 
as you see that pattern of where the actual nerve is located and best area for it, us to target uh, that nerve uh, right at the C2-3 joint line. If you look at the uh, uh, C3, C4, C5, C6, we're looking at it at the middle of the articular process there. And as you see the cross hairs there, uh, that's where you're going to target the C3 and C4 medial branch. So we're targeting that region to get the best um, a burn and, uh, and, and lesion, uh, but we're going to want to be going lengthwise along the nerve to get the best lesion. Yeah, the next couple slides don't really show. Yeah. That's too bad. And looking at the cervical uh, medial branch nerve of C7, uh, as you can see, we're looking at these target points in particular on the superior articular process, process of, uh, of C7 there. Uh, And then radiographically, uh, looking at the nerve, that's uh, so a particular process. Uh, the actual needle is there. Uh, that's what you're wanting to do if you're wanting to do an actual block and providing some anesthetic to that area of the superior process to get at the medial branch nerve. Sorry. Yeah, these no are. Problem. No worries. So I'm looking at the C23. Um, a third occipital nerve, okay, and where is that, as I said, it's embedded within the pericapsular fascia of the C23 joint. The, the target lies uh, on a vertical line that bisects the C23 facet joint. And what will, unfortunately, not depicted here uh, is that the joint line comes across, and then you'll have uh, target uh, uh, above the joint, just above the joint middle of the joint and just below the joint at C23. Uh, for lumbar RF neurotomy and technique in regards to that, placing one or more lesions across the neck of the superior articular process to encompass the target nerve. The appropriate target nerve is the central two-thirds or two-fourths of the neck of the superior articular process. The courses of the L4 medial branch and the L5 primary dorsal ramus are depicted here. And what's important is the uh, needle trajectory. Uh, two considerations apply to the trajectory of the RF needle. For the L1 to L4 medial branch nerves, needles, needles to be, need to be oblique to the sagittal plane. And all segmental levels, need, needles need to be parallel to the nerve to get the best lesion on the nerve. So why the oblique uh, uh, to the sagittal plane? Well, the, the target nerve is marked by a dotted line. If uh, in, in A, uh, if a needle is inserted towards the target zone along the parasitical plane, the mammalo accessory ligament obstructs its course from the lateral surface of the superior articular process. So that's why we do B. We go oblique approximately 20 degrees from the sagittal plane, and therefore we are avoiding the mammalo accessory ligament and providing a nice lesion upon the medial branch nerve, okay? But also to note, so you're going uh, for the lumbar area of L1 to L4 medial branches, you're providing that oblique 20 degree um, uh, tilt towards the side that you're doing. And then you're also providing from the planar view of the vertebral body, about 45 degrees caudal tilt so that the needle can be uh, and projected along the course of the target nerve, as you can see depicted here. So, uh, um, those aren't really showing the, uh, unfortunately, the, but, you know, I discussed those already, but uh, let's move on to the... Uh, so uh, at this point, we're looking at where we're looking at the uh, C23, uh, C3 and C4, and C5, C6 uh, medial branches. As I said, although I'm not sure why they're depicting the parallelograms as the area uh, to actually uh, target for the C23 facet joint and, and targeting the third occipital nerve. Yes, the parallelogram is correct, 
but for the C3 medial branch and C4 medial branch, the parallelogram is not in the right area where they are targeting, targeting actually at the, uh, the crosshairs and into the uh, centroid of the articular pillar. And at the C7 uh, medial branch, we're targeting the actual superior took a process of a C7 at that triangle, as you can see there, okay? So, yeah, that's what I just talked about. So what we're trying to do is provide uh, a place, needle placement on the anterior third of the target articular pillar and perform a serious lesions there. And so we'll place needle there. Uh, position, if, it, if you're positioning the patient in the lateral decubitus, the target side up, you would place the needle as if you were performing a medial branch block right up on the articular pillar and the centroid of the articular pillar. Whereas if you're doing the neurotomy scenario, C3 to C6 needle branch neurotomies and positioning the patient prone, and this approach uh, is taught the true lateral view, raise the skin wheel 15 to 30 degrees slightly below and lateral to the target as depicted by the dotted line and advance the needle towards the anterior third of the target articular pillar. So we will see those uh, articular pillars well and the concavities at those levels. Okay, and, and again, looking at the third occipital nerve and then this C7 medial branch RFA, which we talked about already. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Hold on. These are, there you go. But yeah, complications. And complications is something we need to talk about because uh, they're very real, uh, in, especially in the cervical area. Uh, needles are placed uh, too medially to the joint, passing inside the vertebral canal and entering the spinal cord uh, can occur. And uh, so being very careful, uh, for me, especially for um, uh, doing facet joint injections, uh, maybe looking at uh, uh, looking at the more posterior portion of the actual facet joint, uh, not towards the middle, uh, but more towards the end of the joint or dorsal portion of the joint itself, would be uh, more uh, a safer uh, trajectory and uh, approach. Uh, injuries to spinal nerves and spinal and vertebral artery if the needles are placed too far medially, entered to the target zones for the cervical medial branch. And those are the studies that have shown those couple of complications. But also, uh, when doing neurotomies, we would try to limit as much as possible the number of nerves, nerves to be coagulated. Well, and no more than three at a time. Well, why is that? Well, a lot of cases of dropped head syndrome, uh, uh, post-procedure kyphosis due to extensor muscle denervation uh, can happen. And uh, I've seen this more happen with patients who are getting Botox to the extensor muscles than I have uh, for this, but also just to note, yeah, keep it uh, to uh, no more than uh, three uh, medial branches at a time. Ataxia with third occipital nerve RFA uh, plays a significant role in the cervical proprioception and a constant cutaneous distribution. Ataxia and numbness can be common side effects, uh, but the risk of ataxia possible with unilateral third occipital neurotomy, but you really should try and uh, uh, avoid treating both sides at the same time. That says questions. <laughs> Excellent. All right, any questions from the audience? Any questions so far, yeah. I think a couple key things here, guys, is that there are a lot of different radio frequency uh, technologies, as you can see in the exhibit hall. Uh, what you saw here was the um, the type of RF probes that have a, a certain uninsulated length, you know, depending on what you choose, or five millimeters, 10 millimeters, whatever. Thank you. And uh, the lesion is elliptoid in nature, in general, with, the, with a lot of the competitors. There is, uh, there are, I should say, uh, one or two companies that uh, cycle water or saline uh, through their probes to create a, a larger lesion that's spherical in shape. It's important to understand the morphology of your lesions in order to do the appropriate needle placement. What you saw here was, for example, for the medial branch blocks of the cervical spine, the patient's in a lateral decubitus position, but for their neurotomy, the patient's prone, and they're coming in from a posterior to anterior approach. 
And the reason for that is that needle has to be parallel to the nerve in order to create a larger, you know, the best chance of lesioning the nerve. Whereas if you had a larger spherical lesion that actually has a distal projection, you could still do that lateral approach, lateral decubitus approach. So when you go back to your institutions, you know, next week you have cervical, you know, medial branch blocks or uh, radio frequency ablations, understand that positioning based on the technology you have. It, it just depends on what you have. Uh, and there are pros and cons to both as far as patient positioning, patient satisfaction, amount of pain they experience afterwards, fluoroscopic difficulty, et cetera. So again, uh, this was a, a nice overview. I wish, I wish we had all those images, um, obviously, but uh, you know we're, we're covering for Dr. DePinto, unfortunately had a family emergency. Excellent. All right, if there are no more questions, thanks, Glenn. Well, we we're will... gonna go over the uh, placement for some of the needles for oh, he's actually gonna do stuff. lumbar right. uh, neurotomy. Uh, but uh, here, if we go back to the AP view of the cervical spine here, uh, we look at, uh, excellent, uh, we see the needle occurring on the left portion of the articular pillar at C3. And you see above there, I think the audience can see well, the C12 uh, uh, facet joint and the dens um, coming up there. Can they see that? Can I point to that? Not really, yeah. Um, so, as you see my needle, this patient is in a little bit of flex positioning, uh, flex forward, so I don't, don't really need to provide any caudal tilt uh, to the actual uh, uh, C-arm here. But in a lot of the needle procedures that you'll be doing in your career, there's a term called bone is home. And I don't know if Ramo or Doug, if that was ever keyed on with you gentlemen, but that was one of the best advices I had in, 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 in training and in, in keeping me safe in doing procedures, for uh, needle procedures for the spine. A bone is home. So how is, it, how is it relevant here? Well, we want to keep that needle as close to the articular pillar as possible as we are, uh, as we are proceeding with uh, inserting the needle, okay? So, Picture there. There we go. Point this way. So, C one two joint right there, right below it. C two C two three joint, articular pillar just below it where my needle is at at C three. So I'm staying just a little lateral, entering a little bit lateral to the articular pillar. I see that nice concavity there. Uh, okay, so I'm entering with the needle, making sure I'm not going in too deep. I would go to a lateral, let's have a look at the lateral view. Higher than the lateral, you know, but I need to get a little bit of adjustment to the articular pillars there. Let's go a little, more, let's go a little oblique, oblique towards you. Let's go as far as it goes. And back towards me. a little bit of wag here. With, with cervical uh, imaging, it's always making sure that you are getting a true lateral, and uh, make sure I'm going to accomplish before we move on here. Because what would look like to be in the correct area on the AP view, uh, it looks like we're quite off on the lateral view, but we also want to make sure we're getting a true lateral. Picture there? So how do we do that? We want to do that uh, by lining up the facet joints. We want to make sure this, the vertebral bodies are aligned as well. 
as well as the, the disk spaces. Okay, so it's a little bit high on that aspect. Let's, let's open up the WAG. Uh, WAG, uh, WAG that way for me. It's a little bit better. Um, I can see the two, three joint a little better now. Yeah, as you see, now, you're, now what's appearing is a TC two, three joint. Good there. Okay, stop there. Uh, looks a little bit off on the, still looks a little bit off, but I'm gonna go live there. But if we were targeting the seat third occipital nerve, We'd be going three burns, uh, one being maybe one burn here, a little bit, or a little bit higher than that aspect. Here, another one a little bit higher uh, across the joint, a little bit higher there, and then one a little bit higher occurring as well, right across the C23 joint. Sorry, this needle is off. And, and then and getting at the C3 nerve, medial branch, and coming to the centroid of the articular pillar right in that aspect here. And that would be the same for the C3, 4, 5, and C6. And then, unfortunately, with this uh, cadaver, uh, with the shoulders in the way, uh, visualization of the C7 uh, nerve is uh, virtually uh, impossible. As you can see, the shoulders are uh, inhibiting us from seeing the actual uh, C. Uh, five uh, medial uh, C5 uh, uh, area, okay? But we're, uh, we're gonna do a quick uh, view of the lumbar uh, area, and we're gonna switch over to that. So give us a couple minutes, uh, Ramo. Sounds good. So, uh, you know, in a live patient, let's say you gotta do C7, what would you guys do? Shoulders in the way. Pull the shoulders down, yeah. So you can have the patients, you can tie a uh, sheet to the bottom of the bed, the, the foot side of the bed, and have the patient hold on to it. And then you can cinch up the tension. So that's a nice thing to do. Uh, some people will tape shoulders down. So think about all those things. These are real world issues, as you saw here. Uh, what, I, what I would do on that cervical imaging is just line up the C1 arch. That's, that's a good way to know your wig wag. Uh, and then, of course, you can oblique to, to make sure all the articular pillars line up. Any questions about cervical medial branch, rhizotomy, neurotomy, radiofrequency ablation? I saw this demonstration kind of like an uh, AP, very straight. Do you need like a you know, tube to the... Uh, yeah, we're almost set up here. Uh, or so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so in general, what we teach primarily is this posterior approach, coaxial. But the approach you're describing is actually what I often will do is a slight obliquity. So you're taking advantage of both the lateral and posterior approaches. Uh, and the advantage to that is you can employ a, a curved SMK needle so that you're along the nerve coming in at an angle. And so you, you go through less tissue, that's an advantage. And then number two, by the time you touch down bone, you rotate you know, the curvature away or laterally, and then it'll skive along the bone. So absolutely, that's a modified posterior approach, which is exactly what I do. Because my biggest issue with the posterior approach, which is how I was trained, is that you go through like 10 centimeters of tissue. You know, you've got somebody with a buffalo hump, they're 300 pounds, it's like, oh, man. you know, you're just like dreading it. Uh, so by doing this modified approach, coming in a little bit more laterally, angle in, touch the articular pillar posteriorly, rotate the needle, and then skive along. That should, that should do the trick. So it looks like the way you oblique or tilt the the is not so clear. You know, AP will be more clear. Let's go ahead and straighten that. Yeah, then that's what we fluoroscopically you're using AP and lateral only. But I'm just saying, as far as your your needle approach. You can do the, a, a um, lateral posterior approach. And or, or take the image. All right, Glenn, you ready to rock? Uh, almost. One okay. more minute here. Uh, any other questions? Uh, go oblique towards me. Yeah. Good there. Cranial tilt. Yeah. Just trying to line up the uh, end plate at L4 here. 
if you guys are, are listening. Uh, let's go south. So, yeah, there we go. Take a look at the floral with you and, and watch this set up. So lining up the end plates is always very important when dealing with the, especially with the lumbar and thoracic areas of the spine. Picture there. Trying to get a good visualization. Uh, open up the AP. Open up the uh, cranial tiltimate, sorry. Okay. So I'm sharpening up the end plates here. As you can see there, you're wanting to make sure there's no end plates sharpened. Right now it's almost, uh, probably a little more cranial tilt. And it's almost sharpened. So we're dealing with the different procedures that we're doing in interventional spine. Having a nice sharpened end plate is key. So we talked about earlier uh, making sure that uh, we're providing some obliquity to the uh, sagittal plane uh, to target the uh, medial branch. Uh, uh, so we're going to do it at the uh, L4 uh, bone there, uh, targeting the L3 medial branch. I'll go oblique towards me, uh, approximately 20 degrees. So we're targeting here. Oblique towards me, 20 degrees. Oh, 20? Yeah. It's 20. Perfect. So there. So we're talking this area here, but also we want to make sure we're going along the uh, along the uh, length of the nerve. Uh, so about 45 degrees from there. 45 degrees. Yeah. Let's uh, caudal. Caudal. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Let me know when you're done. Yeah. That's 45. Okay. There. I would go to 30 in my in this case though. Go a little cranial tilt 30, uh, 15 degrees up cranial. Yeah. Good there. So we're talking to you here. Stop there. So now we're, we're avoiding the mammalar accessory ligament. Picture there. Live picture. No, no, picture. Walk it there. Yeah. So we're talking to this area and right down the II to target the region right here, to target the medial branch. All right. Okay, any questions so far regarding lumbar neuronomies? Any questions, guys? All good. All right. Glenn, if that's all you got, I think uh, we'll move on to a break. No questions on this side. Pass it on to you guys. Thank you. All right, cool. Grab a break, guys, and then we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll keep it going. Thank you. Before we go, uh, did want to talk about some of the technologies. Oh, and, uh, oh, and uh, I know we have Boston Scientific uh, oh, who has uh, uh, sponsored us from actually day one um, and uh, helped in uh, starting off our fellowship uh, conferences uh, and, and uh, course for, uh, since eight years ago. So thank you for Boston Scientific. Uh, but uh, here what we have is uh, Boston Scientific's Radio frequency generator. Uh, you know, they have a very large uh, product portfolio for RF, including reusable, reusable and disposable probes and a wide array of cannula sizes, uh, four independent channels to create optimal lesion. They have a touch screen. See here. Uh, pulsed or thermal RF and a unique uh, uh, array of probes for targeting different parts of the spine, including SI joints. So. Uh, please uh, have a look at the uh, uh, the uh, station for uh, RF for uh, Boston Scientific, and have a look at the uh, hardware that they have. All right. Also, we have the uh, displayed here the Medtronic uh, generator. You see that on the uh, actually? You see it? 
Can you turn it a little bit? It is also a touch screen, uh, four channel independent control, uh, 50 watt power. Uh, it, it does have the ability to add uh, a cooled pump, uh, RF, uh, cooled RF. Uh, not unlike uh, the Avanos uh, technology, uh, using uh, employing the uh, a cooled RF uh, type of technology, where the uh, there is um, uh, uh, water coming through the uh, tip of the uh, probe uh, to help prov provide uh, and prevent charring from occurring and uh, less heat sink. Um, also, in addition to that, some uh, smart chips in the probes to identify and quickly. Uh, on which probe uh, is being used, uh, which is quite useful, and and and, uh, and and where you're at, and making sure which probe is where. Uh, also, a smart start algorithm to start all four channels at the same time, uh, to ensure all channels uh, reach appropriate power. But also with a upgradable um, upgradable software and touchscreen as well. All right. Thanks for Thanks very much, guys.